Hey folks, <clears throat> we're going to take a look today as we continue thermodynamics, looking at the first law of thermodynamics and how that relates to a process known as calorimetry in order to study how energy transfers from thermal energy specifically from one material to another. So first, right, and, and this is one of the, 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 the big laws of thermodynamics here, right, the first law, which is going to state that the thermal energy must be conserved as it goes from one material to another. So if you look at the equation that's up here, we have Q gained equals Q lost. So that means the energy, the thermal energy gained by one material has to be equivalent to the thermal energy lost by another. But we know mathematically that's not, gonna, that's not going to be sound, right? Because if you gain thermal energy, your temperature increases. And if you lose thermal energy, your temperature has decreased. So technically, that would be read as the energy gained equals the negative amount of energy lost. And we know a positive can't equal a negative. So by technicality, if you look at that bottom formula there, the thermal energy gained is equal to the negative of the thermal energy lost. Because again, to gain thermal energy, delta T will be positive. Specific heat C will be positive, and that is always a positive value. And the mass is going to be positive of that material as well. So if we lose thermal energy, the mass will be positive. C, the specific heat, will always be positive, And delta T would be negative. So we make that entire quantity on the thermal energy that is lost side negative is not saying that the, neg that the energy itself is negative. We need to place that there so mathematically it is going to be sound. Also, keep in mind which material starts warmer and which material starts colder when we talk about the law of thermodynamics here. If a material is gaining thermal energy, that means it started at a colder relative temperature, right? Its temperature increased as a result of the interaction between the two substances. So the object that lost thermal energy, that has to be the object that started at a higher temperature and then became cooler as a result. So again, we have energy transfer from high energy to low energy, so from hot temperature to colder temperature, which means gaining energy, you get warmer, losing energy, you get cooler. If we break this down, right, so if we break this down, into the Q, the Q equals negative Q into its individual components, we get MC delta T equals negative MC delta T. So the material that has gained energy and the material that has lost energy, we can differentiate based on that negative sign. So on the right hand side here, right, if we get the material to release thermal energy, that means its final temperature has to be less than its starting temperature. So that delta T is negative, which is again why we have that negative on the right-hand side, because negative times negative gets you a positive. On the left-hand side here, on the side that gains thermal energy, this is where we're going to see an increase in thermal energy for this material based on that contact. So we're going to have that positive change in our temperature. So the left side is net positive. The right side is negative times negative, which yields a positive as well. And again, this is going to happen when two materials come in contact with each other. And through the zeroth law of thermodynamics, where we see that, hey, we're going to have two objects that are in contact, so their temperatures will eventually be the same. Part of the second law of thermodynamics tells us, hey, it's going to flow from high to cold, or from high energy to low energy, hot temp to low temp. The first law is going to tell us we put them in contact long enough. Here's the way this energy is going to flow. And we're going to see that these two materials, should you place them in contact, are going to have the same final temperature, even though their initial temperatures may be different. So their final temperatures, because they're connected here, are going to be the same as a result. Now, a method that we use to, to test this and to, and to verify the first law of thermodynamics is known as calorimetry. Now, what this method does, and it's predominantly used in food sciences, right, to, to help determine the caloric value of certain materials, um, they, they basically take it and they figure out through burning of the material how much energy it takes to do that, and that's where they get the, the calorie from, right? Very, very um, abbreviated version there. Look it up if you want more in-depth information. Um, 
But as we look at this energy transfer from, from one material to another, we see that the energy that goes has to be the same, right? So the energy from, high, from the high temp to the low temp object, the energy that it gives is going to be equivalent to the energy gained by that cooler object. And how that temperature is going to change is going to be based on that specific heat. So, so you have two materials, you bring them in contact with each other. How much each of those materials temperature changes by is going to be dependent on the masses and on the specific heats. Keep in mind what a high specific heat value means. So to give an example of what calorimetry looks like, I have a volume of water and I have this random plastic cone looking thing. Now, this calorimetry method would state if I take this plastic kind of bluish cone and place it in the water, eventually they're going to reach the same temperature, right? The water has some starting temperature and this plastic, um, this plastic cone has a starting temperature. So we would place it in, right? And that with enough time, we're going to see that the water and that plastic cone are going to reach the same temperature. This is in essence what a calorimetry experiment looks like. Getting two materials to an equilibrium temperature to determine masses, to determine specific heats, to determine how much energy flowed from one substance to another, right? That's what this calorimetry looks like. So mathematically, here's an example, right? We have we have this prospect, right? We'll call him Prospector Pete because that just seems to be fitting. So Prospector Pete, right, in a, in a desperate attempt to have a nice warm bath, he heats up some gold, giving you the specific heat there of 129 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. He's going to heat that nugget, likely over a nice, a nice wood fire, right, given that he's a prospector. And he's going to heat that to 500 degrees Celsius. That is going to be a hot chunk of gold. Drops it into a bathtub and the bathtub has 55 kilograms of water, and that water starts at 24 degrees Celsius, so just above room temperature, which is considered 20 degrees Celsius. What mass of gold would be necessary in order for the water to have a final temperature of 39 degrees Celsius? So pause the video, attempt this problem, and then come back to see the solution. Okay, welcome back. Here's the way that we would go about this problem. So we know that the water is going to be the object that is gaining thermal energy, right? The water has an initial temperature of 24 degrees. It's going to heat to a final temperature of 39. As a result, we know that it has an increase in temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. So that is going to be the object that is gaining thermal energy. It's going to be placed on the left side of the equation. Our right side we know is going to be gold because the gold is going to start at 500 degrees and given enough time, it is going to reach the same final temperature as the water, right? That's the whole purpose is we put that gold in the water. At some point, we're going to reach an equilibrium temperature. And that equilibrium statement, again, coming from the second law of thermodynamics, that that energy will flow from high temp to low temp until equilibrium is reached. So here we see the 500 degree temperature of the gold nugget reduced down to 39 degrees Celsius. So as a result, we know that that gold nugget has lost thermal energy. So it is going to go on the right side of the formula. We know the specific heats of each one of these materials. We know gold is 129 that is given to us. And water, which is in one of the tables prior, is 4,180 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. We know the mass of the water. We are solving for the mass of the gold. So our left side, we're going to see 55 kilograms times 4,180 joules per kilogram degree Celsius times our change in temperature, which is 39 minus 24 degrees Celsius, giving us a change of 15 degrees Celsius. So we have all the information for the water so we can find the amount of thermal energy that was gained by the water. And as you can see, it is a very, very large amount of energy that was gained. On the right hand side, we have the specific heat and we have the change in temperature. We are solving for the mass. So that negative in front of the energy loss side on the gold side is going to cancel with that negative change in temperature. So we can take our specific heat times the change in temperature there and get rid of the negative, 
right? So we get our energy gained equals the mass of the gold times the joules per kilogram represented by the gold. We divide it out and we get 58 kilograms would be the chunk of gold, which is about 128 pounds. So this prospector freaking struck it rich by having a 58 kilogram or 128 pound chunk of gold. I don't know where he's finding a bathtub to, to fit all that gold, but good for that prospector because that person is now filthy stinking rich if this were the gold rush in the 1800s. So there is a numerical look at calorimetry as well as, again, just, just the base process of the first law of thermodynamics and how it relates to calorimetry, right? Recognizing that the energy gained by a cooler substance is equal and opposite to the energy lost by a warmer substance. And when we combine materials and when they make contact through calorimetry and we get that energy to transfer, we see that the materials are always going to be at the same final temperature when given enough time to reach equilibrium. Thanks, folks.